Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Church Online. So glad that we can connect once again this morning together. Well, listen, I want to make just a couple of announcements with you just before we move into our time of praise and worship, and then, of course, for our Bible study this morning. And one of them is that this Wednesday night, you don't want to miss it. We're going to have a great time. There's going to be cookies, chocolate, coffee, you name it, candy. We're going to have a great time. We're all combining together, boys and girls and adults, in the sanctuary for a time of special music. There are individuals who will be sharing special music as well as families. And you just don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great time as we really celebrate the birth of Christ together and enjoy a great time of fellowship. So that's this Wednesday night. December the 14th, 7 o'clock. So come join us if you're physically capable of doing that. And then next Sunday, next Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. is going to be a special some Sunday at First Assembly. We have some great things planned in our Sunday morning worship service. And then the boys and girls have some great things happening and are being visited by Santa and Mrs. Claus who will be sharing one of the greatest stories ever told. That's ever, ever, ever hit their ears, and they don't want to miss it. It's the story of Jesus and who he is and who it was that actually came at Christmas time. And so they don't want to miss that. It's going to be a great time. Every boy, every girl will be receiving a gift from Santa and Mrs. Claus. And again, they'll be hearing the Christmas story. So that's going to be a great time together. And then I want to make sure that you mark this down. On Christmas Sunday, December 25th, our service will be at 10 a.m., not 10.30, the time we usually meet together, but 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on December 25th, we'll be gathering together in the sanctuary, all combined together, for one great service celebrating the birth of Christ. And then I just want to let you know that we have our annual foundational 21 days of prayer and fasting happening in January. It will take place from January the 8th through the 28th, 21 days of prayer and fasting. I want to just ask you to come and join us and be a part of this all-church 21 days of prayer and fasting. Our theme for our fasting and prayer time uh, 2023 is Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And that's not only our theme for our prayer and fasting time, but it's going to also be our theme for all of 2023. And so, you guessed it, we're anticipating just a great, great year at First Assembly, inviting the Holy Spirit to come and join us and help us each and every Sunday, each and every day of every week in 2023. So come and join us for, uh, for a, a time of praise and worship on Wednesday, next Sunday, and then join us for our prayer and fasting in January. There'll be some great information that'll be on our website to help you. Some resources uh, in case you've never fasted before. There'll be some helps there as also some resources. So I want to let you know about that just before we come to the Lord and turn our hearts to Him in praise and worship just before the message this morning. Let's worship the Lord together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I am held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing it again. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. We sing this out all my life. 
all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship this morning. It's always good to be able to lift our hands and give praise and worship to Jesus. Being mindful of all that he's done for us, it's pretty easy to just lift our hands, to shout a praise of worship to him. So thank you again, worship team, for leading us in worship on this wonderful again, Sunday morning. I want to share this morning from Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd invite you to open it up, and let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Now, 
all of the national news magazines, and you probably have noticed this as you go through the lines in the grocery store, have picked up on some, some interesting things that are taking place in our culture. And it seems like we come to this almost on an annual basis. Every time we come around the Thanksgiving or the Christmas uh, season, you look at magazines and even in the, the news cycle, you'll hear that they have, they, have, they have caught on and they're sensing something in the culture. And if you look at some of the articles in the periodicals that are there, you'll come across things with messages like, In Search of Christmas, uh, Searching for Jesus, Finding God, uh, another In Search for the Sacred, America's Quest for Spiritual Meaning. And I think more than ever, these past couple of years have been a tough couple of years on our culture. Um, there, we see people now who, who just are kind of lost. They're looking for their way. They're, uh, they're looking for something to bring fulfillment to the, uh, the unrest that they have in their souls. There's anxiety enough to go around. There's fear that's out there. No peace, no contentment. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's the next COVID variant that's going to be coming along and so what we have is really our culture has just been, has, has become one that is in search of hope. It's in search of peace. It's in search of something that will bring purpose to their lives. When we look at our culture, it's, uh, it's become a, uh, a thing where right is wrong and wrong is right. And we're, we, we kind of shake our heads. But it's, it's all a culture that is crying out and shouting out in, des in desperation for something that would bring peace and bring hope. There are questions like, who can give me the answers to the basic questions of life? The, uh, the spiritual questions like, why am I here? Where am I going? Where did I come from? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? Is there a purpose in life? Is there a God? And if there is a God, does he want relationship with me? How can I make connection with him? How can I know him? And those are some of the questions that are being asked by just scores of people, millions and millions of people across our country. You probably work with some of those people. You may have some of those people, even within your own families, that are in desperate need and are crying out in lots of different ways, but they're crying out and they're desperate for hope. They're desperate for peace that really only God can give. And so they're searching. They're searching. They're on the hunt. They're looking. And if you are listening in this morning, and you're a spiritual seeker this morning, I want you to know that you're in good company this morning. Because there was another group, a couple of groups of people that were just like that. We, uh, we, we call them the wise men. We also look at the shepherds, and both of these groups of people were people who were, were interested. The, uh, the, the supernatural events that were taking place around them caught their attention, and they began to follow those signs that were there. So when we look at the wise men, it's a, uh, when we see Christmas programs, you probably remember maybe a Christmas program that you were a part of, when they're passing out the, uh, the parts, everybody wants to be the wise men because they're dressed with crowns and robes and, and uh, all of these, these nice things. And then you look at the shepherds and the wall is just like a, uh, a, you know, like a kimono that you put on and you go out there with a head wrap. But the, uh, the wise men were an interesting group of people. And so when we look at them in the scripture, the term that is given to them We've, we've heard of them as the three wise men, the three kings of Orient. Um, but the scripture calls them, they were the Magi. And the, uh, the Magi, and I, and I think the best term for them, really, if we want to go back to the beginning of our time when we're looking at a title for a message, I think we can even call them the original Google seekers. The wise men were the original seekers. They were on the hunt. They were interested in something that would bring hope to them and peace to their souls. 
And they were seekers of God. They were searching for truth. They were searching for a Savior who they knew could fill the emptiness and end their search for hope. Well, who were these guys really anyway? Well, you know, shepherds, we knew who the shepherds were. They were folks that were out there. Their job was to, to tend to the sheep, to make sure they were protected and watched after. But the wise men, who were these, these men? Kind of mysterious. But who were, who were these men? The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about them. It doesn't give us a lot of details about who they really were. In fact, we know less about them than probably anybody else in the nativity scene. For instance, we don't really know who they were. They were given the term magi in the Bible, and magi was a term for a person who was kind of like a, a combination of astronomer, scientist, doctor, philosopher. So they were, they were very learned men. They were very well-educated, <clears throat> very well-educated uh, men. We know that they were also very wealthy, uh, the magi were. The Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us exactly where they came from. We know that they came from the east. The scripture says they came from the east, but in the, the particular vicinity of the east, we don't really even know that. They, they came from the east. That could have been Persia. It could have been India. It could have been China. But we really don't know. We really don't know. We don't, we, but we do know that they had to cross the Middle Eastern desert to get to Bethlehem, to get to Jerusalem, to get to what we know today, the Holy Land. And it probably took them probably about three to four, maybe even six months to get to Israel. So we don't even really know how many wise men there were. I, I think we sing songs, we three kings of Orient are, you know, bearing gifts. And, and we uh, when we see the nativity scene, there's the three wise men and so we kind of grow up just thinking, well, there was three of them. But in reality, there was probably a dozen, maybe even more than a dozen of these wise men that were together. So there's a lot of things, a lot of particulars about these men that we don't know about. But what we do know is what they did that caused them to find God. And if you're searching this morning... You may not be a follower of Jesus. I think if you'll, if you'll embrace the three things that these wise men did to find the Savior, I think you will too. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning and maybe uh, fears and anxieties, maybe there's some health issues that have just seemed to overwhelm you and kind of cause you to lose your way a little bit. If you'll do what the wise men did, these three things... I know for a fact you'll find the Savior, you'll find His peace, you'll find strength in your life today. Well, let's look at the things that they did, the three things they did. Number one, the wise men sought the truth. They sought the truth. If you want to find God, you've got to seek the truth. You've got to go after it. Become a seeker. Take it serious. Hey, I need God. I want to know about God. And that's one thing we know about these wise men is they were diligent in their search for truth. They wanted answers for the questions that they had. And really, that's what the wise men were. Matthew chapter 2, it shares the story of the wise men. It says this here. It says, after Jesus' birth, and again, it was probably some months after Jesus' birth by the time they arrived. It says, after Jesus' birth, the wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, and they were asking this here, where is the child born to be king of the Jews? We have observed his star rising, and we have come to worship him. So notice in this passage of scripture that there are three things that a person who is a, a, a genuine seeker, a, a genuine person who is searching for truth and searching for the answers in their lives. First of all, we see in this passage of Scripture that, uh, that the genuine seekers, they, they kind of have an idea of what's happening around them. And the second thing is genuine seekers, they ask questions. You know, what do you think this means? And uh, 
What does this sign mean? Where is it? Where do you go with this here? You know, what do we do? What direction do we go? And then the third thing they did was they did whatever it took. They did whatever it took to find the answer. So listen, friends, uh, let's, let's do whatever it takes to find the truth about why I'm here, about where I'm going. Is there a God? Does he care about me? Well, he does. But listen, full court press in, uh, in going after it. So I think, you know, I think about this really every year. Every year at Christmas time, it, it crosses my mind that it's, that it's ironic that Jesus was born, you know, when he was born, you know, the, the religious center of the world, the, the, uh, the religious educational system of the world was in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was only six miles away from Bethlehem, and, you know, I'd known that it was close, but when Terry and I went on the Holy Land trip several years ago, we were in Jerusalem, and that day we were going to visit Bethlehem. Our hotel was in Jerusalem, and so we got on the touring bus, and we headed out for Bethlehem, and I was just absolutely blown away at how close it really was. So, so once again, all of the religious scholarship of the world at that time was concentrated right there in Jerusalem. And they're only six miles away from where Jesus was born. But listen, not one of them that we know of, of from the scripture, not one of the, those leaders went six miles to search for Jesus. You see, these guys, that, these wise men that came, um, there's, there's nothing that indicates that they were believers. They were probably pagans that are coming from a foreign country, but they were genuine in seeking for the Savior, the King of the Jews. And so because of that, guess what happened to them? They found the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the problem with, with many of us to, today is that we want to know the truth, but we don't want to make time to find it. We all want to know God and have deep relationship with God, but we don't want to take the time to find Him. And it's, it's tragic, really, uh, for us to go through life without cementing a relationship that's being offered to us by God and seeking Him. See, God created every single one of us. Every one of us He created with a, a soul that is like a, a, a vacuum that, that can never be filled and nothing can fill it but the presence and the person of Jesus Christ. Not money, not fame, not pleasure, not having all kinds of, of wonderful things. Only God can fill the God-shaped emptiness that's in us. He's the only one that can fill that void. And that's what really, what these wise men were searching for. And you know, perhaps it's what you're searching for this morning, is God's peace, and God's comfort, and He'll bring it to you. Jeremiah chapter 29, 13 says this here, says, when you search for me with all of your heart, he said, you will find me. You will find me if you search for me with all of your heart. Listen, God is interested in relationship with you. I think that's the message of Christmas this morning, is God is interested in having a relationship with you. He's interested in filling the emptiness. He's interested in... In, uh, in pushing aside and, and wiping out fears and anxieties that may be haunting you this morning, He's come. He has sent Jesus to be the answer to all those things. Search, seek, look to Him. Do what it takes to, uh, to come into a relationship with the Lord. Well, the second thing that these wise men did was that they, they experienced joy. Enjoy the fact that God has already taken the first step, hoping that you, in response, would come to Him. And the way He does that is He gives us signs. He reveals Himself in, in so many different ways, but he, he gives a sign. He gives you a sign. He gives you a clue. 
He gives you a trail marking to let you know you're on the right track. You're going in the right direction. You know, Sammy and Nate and myself, the two boys, periodically will do a backpack trip. It's usually the Eastern Sierras or in the, uh, the Yosemite uh, wilderness area. And so, you know, we'll throw our packs on and all, and uh, we'll start to head up toward Little Yosemite Valley, our ultimate goal for reaching Half Dome. But we'll, we'll, we'll start heading out, and, and the trailhead from Happy Isles Trailhead from the valley floor, it takes you up toward the Mist Trail. You're there right there at Vernal Falls, and then there's the Mist Trail, and you're thinking, man, I don't want to go up that kind of a grade and all those stairs with 35, 40 pounds on your back in your backpack. And so you, uh, you've heard that, listen, there are some switchbacks that make it a lot easier. And so you're looking for these signs, and sure enough, you get to that place, and there, there they are. There are those signs that give you direction. And there's nothing like them. And then sometimes you'll be on the trail, and it may get a little obscure. But man, it's so good when you come across another sign that says, listen, uh, you know, 2.3 miles to go. And you'll keep going. All of a sudden, you'll see another sign, you know, 1.2 miles to Little Yosemite Valley. And you get all excited and go, oh, we're, we're on the right track. And you know, the, uh, the, in the wise man's, case, wise man's case, their travel guide, their travel signs was a star. And it was a special star. It wasn't a mere normal star. A lot of people think that maybe the star was, was some kind of a comet or a supernova or asteroid. Nobody really knows but they, uh, what, what exactly it looked like. But we do know this here. It was a star. It was a sign. And that star gave them guidance and gave them direction to where Jesus was. And you know, he does that for each and every one of us. Because he loves us, he'll put a star, he'll put a sign in your life. That sign might be a book that you've read, a person that you know, an experience, a TV show, a movie. It might be an event, a church service that you have been to. It might be a Christian husband or a Christian wife or a Christian parent, uh, a Christian brother or a Christian uh, sister. But, but we, we, we just know this here. If you are searching for the Savior... He won't leave you without a traveling guide. He brings these people into our lives so we can see where he wants us to be headed. And that is into a relationship with him. Well, the third thing that we see with these wise men was their, uh, their, their reaction. Their reaction. There are three possible reactions. When God starts to guide your life, and you start to realize, maybe this is God speaking to me. Maybe this is God who is giving me direction. And when we, when we recognize it, that it may be a book, it might be a person, it might be a, a sermon that we have heard, but, uh, but when, we, when we, we give attention to it, you know, what's our reaction? Our reaction can, can come out in one of three ways. One, you can react like Herod did. And Herod was, was fearful. You know, when you find this baby, let me know. Let me know. He was fearful of, of Jesus. He was afraid of being guided by God. Or, second of all, you can react like the religious leaders did. They were indifferent. They were skeptical. They were apathetic. They didn't get off their hands. They were six miles away from them. The Savior of the world was born the Messiah, the one they had read about and studied about, six miles away. And yet, they missed it because they were indifferent, they were apathetic. Or, you, uh, you can act like Herod, react like he did in fear. You can react like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the religious community of, of that day, indifferent, apathetic, skeptical. Or, you can react like the wise men did and when they found the child, this is their reaction, they celebrated, they rejoiced, they experienced the joy of being led by God. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 10 says this here, And when they saw the star, 
they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now that's an interesting word there, exceedingly, because if you look it up in the original language that the scripture was written here in the Greek, the, uh, it literally means that they, they jumped up and down. They were ecstatic. They were excited. They were going crazy. They were so excited with what they had seen. The Bible says, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Listen, if you're a believer today, you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, I want to challenge you during this Christmas season to thank God for the stars in your life. Those, uh, those signposts, those people that may have led you to the Savior, those signs that God allowed you to see, those people that He put in your path, that book you may have read. Take time and say, thank you, Lord, for those signs. Thank you for the stars that you put in my life that helped me to find the Savior. Now listen, 2020 has been, uh, or, or 2020, 2021, They've been difficult years, uh, and, I, and I believe it's, it's you know, the end of 2019, 2020, 2021, where this pandemic has, has hit, and it's impacted probably everybody. It's impacted marriages, it's uh, impacted our sons and daughters, it's impacted people with their health. Uh, maybe you've had financial difficulties as a result of it. Maybe your goals and your dreams have been impacted as well. But listen, I want you to step back for just a minute. In the midst of all that stuff, um, listen, could it be that maybe in the midst of everything, there is a star and there is a sign that God has put in front of you to draw you to himself. At Christmas time, at Christmas time, and this is Christmas time, I have some really good news for you. Terry and I were just talking about this scene in the scripture, Luke chapter 2, where the shepherds, those Bedouins, were out in the field taking care of the sheep by night, the scripture says. And then it says this in the scripture, Luke chapter 2, and lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to these shepherds, and, uh, and there was a, a, a glorious light that lit up the sky. You want to talk about a light show um, that lit up the sky. These shepherds are there, and I'm confident they had to be just startled, thinking like, what in the world is happening here? A glorious, glorious uh, scene. And the angel appears, and he speaks to the shepherds, and he said, listen, I've got some of the most joyful news that you have ever heard. It's an announcement, and it's not just for you. It's for everyone. And this is what the announcement is. And this is the message. Your Savior has been born tonight. I bring you the most joyful news ever announced. And it's for everyone. Your Savior has been born tonight. Well, listen, at Christmas time, what does that mean? What does that mean for the person who is Googling for Jesus? What does that mean for the person who is searching for the Savior? Well, this is what it means. It means three things. God has reached out to you. And it means three things here. God has the most glorious Christmas gift for you and for I. And it's His Son, Jesus Christ, His Son. And He's wrapped up that Christmas gift in three wonderful things. And here they are. Number one, God says, listen, I want to offer you and I want to give you forgiveness for everything that you have ever done. I want to offer that to you. Anything you've done in your past, I want to offer you forgiveness if you'll come to me. He not only offers the gift of forgiveness, but he offers us the gift of purpose and power to live for him today. Forgiveness of sin, purpose for today, the power to make it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the freedom to live with a, uh, a conscience that is clear and is clean. He offers that to you. And then the third thing, God offers us security of knowing that we have a home in heaven. That it's there for us after we take our last breath. What a, what a deal. Every time I think about that, I think, gosh, forgiveness 
for anything I've ever done in the past or today, the future. God offers me forgiveness. He says, this is a gift I want to give to you. He offers not only the gift of forgiveness, but the gift of purpose for life today. Giving you purpose. And then the third thing is, uh, he offers to us the hope of eternity. I've often said this here, that really, you're not really ready to live and enjoy life until you're ready to die. And of course, that's just saying that, listen, until you've got peace in your heart, you've made peace with God, you're not going to enjoy life. And here he is, God offers to you those three gifts this day. And then the uh, third thing is, recognize, recognize the gift that God offers to you this morning. And the gift is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? But have everlasting life. So God comes to us this Christmas season again, and he says, Here, I'm offering to you. Uh, you're searching, I'm responding to your search. Here, I'm offering you forgiveness of sin, purpose for today, and the free gift of eternal life. What do I do to get it? Well, you just ask for it. You say, God, I want to receive that today. And you can do that this morning, right where you're at. You can say, Jesus, I've got sin in my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life, and I want to receive the free gift of eternal life as well. Relationship with you. And put your faith in what Christ accomplished on the cross. He died on the cross. He rose three days later to offer you these gifts this Christmas season. Won't you embrace him? And won't you take him up on the gifts that he offers to you? Lord, we're thankful so much again today for the wonderful free gift of eternal life that you offer to us. But Lord, so much more than that, the forgiveness of sin. And, and Lord, for the purpose and the contentment that we can have in living here and now today. And Lord, there are so many who are battling with, with fears. And there are so many who are battling with anxieties. There are so many who are living without purpose. They just don't know what tomorrow holds. And I just pray, Lord, that you would minister healing to them that you would come, Lord Jesus. Come and bring peace and bring hope and bring comfort to them as they search for you. You did it for the wise men, Heavenly Father. You gave them a sign. You gave them a star. And I pray that you will do that for these wonderful people this morning. Give them a sign. Give them a star to follow that will lead them into your presence. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And everyone said, Amen, and Amen, and Amen. Well, God bless you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you Friday at TGIF for our family time of carols and fellowship and special music. So join us, won't you, uh, this Friday, 7 o'clock. God bless you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.